I don't think it's a coincidence that we should be looking at the life and dedication of a man who served his Savior and his King. Our reading this morning is Philippians chapter 1, verses 18b to 26. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. May God add blessing to his most precious word. Good morning. It's uh, lovely to be, I was going to say back, back here, but I've never been in this building before, but it's good to be back with your church. What, what do you live for? My wife and I are huge tennis fans, and um, now with all these television channels, you can almost watch tennis every day of your life. Neither of us play, but we watch. Cameron Norrie, you will have heard of him, British number one. He says, I, I will make as many sacrifices as possible to give myself the best possible chance to become number one in the world. That is my goal. That's his goal in life. And the goat, I, I have puzzled, what, what does goat mean? But it means greatest of all time. Um, she is regarded as the greatest of all time, Serena Williams. And her trainer said this at one time, she's someone who has the biggest belief in her own abilities that I've ever met in my life. She thinks she can move mountains. She thinks that when she decides something, nothing can stop her. Her goal, number one, and um, to beat Margaret Court's record in the number of Grand Slams won. And our own Andy Murray, perhaps more Scottish and more diffident. He says this coming back from his injury and his operation, I want to push and see how far I can go. Lots of people told me I wouldn't be able to play again. That was nonsense. I want to see how close I can get back to the top of the game. As I've as I've looked at this passage and, and read it over and reread it, it's interesting this song that we've just sung. My wife and I sung that as a duet when we were in our 20s, not realizing what following Christ would cost us, but yet not realizing how much blessing following Christ brings. It's a huge challenge, this passage. And as I read it, it was almost as if the Lord was re-examining me. What, what's my ambition, really? 
It's certainly not tennis number one ranking. Is it, or was it my career? Was it promotion? Was it family and the happiness of our family and security? Was it health? Was it holidays? Do I live for the next holiday? Financial security, better home or car? That was certainly my ambition when I was younger. Is it fitness? You can see that I certainly didn't get there. What is it? Now, these things actually are not wrong in themselves. And that's a very important thing to, to remember here. We're not talking about bad things. We're not saying, I want to be the greatest murderer in the world, or I want to be the most deceitful person in the world. I want things that are good in themselves, but they can become a God to me. They can become before Christ in my life. And they have done. And they keep recurring and they come back. And don't think just because I am one of the 6% that Andrew was kindly referring to who was alive at the previous king. Don't think that these temptations stop when you reach 26 as I am. <laughs> no matter how old you are, these temptations still come. And they fill our minds and our hearts. And Christ is displaced there. The things we think about first thing in the morning and keep recurring, coming into our minds all through the day. And sometimes waking us in the night. How can I sort this out? How can I do this? And they come before Christ. It may be even leadership in our church that I desire. I want to be an elder, a good elder. I want to be the best elder ever. It might be our ministry. It might be the, the thing that we lead or are involved in or serve in in our church. I want to be a home group leader. I want to be the, the best. I want other people to know that our home group's the best. Um, it may be you're in the catering side. Sometimes, you know, it's interesting. We've had a team in our catering, I'm not, certainly not going to mention names here, but who worked hard in the kitchen for years, but it became their ministry. And when somebody came in and suggested maybe changing something, which was so obvious it would make things better, absolutely no! It's become their God. And so often, maybe as even as I've preached and maybe even as I've led as an elder, I have had that attitude I know best. And I'm, I've now been an elder for so many years, I know what's right. And it becomes a God. And Christ is displaced. And the results that we are looking for become more important than Jesus himself. We become possessive of our wee corner of church work and jealous of others who are maybe up front or doing something that we would like to do. And Christ is displaced. We become competitive and we promote disunity. Oswald Chambers I often quote Oswald Chambers because he's taught me so much. He says, the good things are often the greatest enemy of the best. Have you got that? The good things that we aim for often are the things that displace Christ and put Him down there. And I suspect that almost every one of us, if not every one of us, in this church this morning have good things that we have displaced Christ for at times.
and maybe now. False idols, if you like. And in this passage, Paul nails his colors to the mast. He says, for to me to live is Christ. He confirms his first loyalty. His priority in thinking and desire is that Christ is lifted up and honored above all others, including himself. It's a challenging passage. What is my first love? Who is my first love? To what or to whom is it directed? Can I truly say it's Jesus? Can I? Only I can answer that. I can't answer it for you. You can answer it for me. It's like the hymn, I Surrender All. I don't know if you know that. You probably do know that hymn. I can't sing that hymn. Sometimes I do. But as I'm singing, I'm saying, Lord, is this right? Am I actually doing that? I surrender all. I find it so hard. It, it's, it's a lump in my... And the trouble is, the chorus it repeats and it repeats and it repeats, doesn't it? And I sometimes, honestly, I'm wishing for just sing one verse, get it over with. Because it, it pierces me. I need to be honest. The context of this passage is this, that Paul was in prison, probably Rome, but some people think he was in prison at Ephesus when he wrote this letter doesn't really matter too much, but he was imprisoned. Why? Because he'd been preaching the gospel, because Christ was first. And when he was in prison, he was witnessing to the poor guards that were there. They, could, they couldn't escape. He was telling them about the gospel. And it was spreading throughout the whole prison. How wonderful is that? But while he was in there, there were people in the church in Philippi and elsewhere who round about were preaching Christ. And they were saying, that's Paul out of the way. I can become prominent now. I can preach. Some of them were preaching from good motives because they loved Christ, but some of them were glad that Paul was out of the way. They were preaching from self-centered motives, dishonest motives. Maybe I can muscle in there, in here and influence the churches to my way of thinking. Maybe even I can lead this church. Now Paul's away. Now if that happened to me, I'd be furious. I'd do all I could to stop these men. But Paul has an absolutely staggering response here. And it's there in verse 18, the first part. What does it matter? What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. I rejoice. It's been mentioned so often this morning. I, I don't know how Paul did this. Do you know, when the Queen became ill on Thursday afternoon, I wrote in our community Facebook page, just asking people to remember her and thank, and mentioned her Christian faith and said, Perhaps we should pray that God in His grace will give her strength in these hours. I got contacted by the administrator of the post, of the Facebook page, and said, take it down. You have mentioned Christian religion, and you've asked people to pray. I was furious. I didn't act like Paul. But the circumstances were different. You see, Paul, if these people had been preaching a false gospel, 
never name their motives. Uh, if he had been preaching a false go- gospel, he would have been furious and he would have said, stop them speaking. This is a false gospel. But they were preaching Christ, albeit from wrong motives, but they were preaching Christ. And he looked past their motives and he said, he, Christ, is being preached, so that's fine. Slightly different than the Facebook, but in a sense, what I realized was, and I've been, it's been occupying my mind, I'm trying to, def- I'm thinking, how do, I, how do I react to this? How do I contact, well, I have contacted them, and, and speak to them in a way that, and I realized what I was trying to do is justify myself. Is Christ more important, or, or is my reputation more important? It doesn't matter to me what the motives and the the aims of these men are, says Paul. They're preaching Christ, and that's brilliant. That allows me to rejoice, for I love Christ so much more than my reputation or standing in the church. The two great English evangelists, um, I read this just the other day, John Wesley and George Whitfield, they disagreed on doctrinal matters. They traveled throughout England preaching and saw many people come to faith, countless people. Um, And multitudes of people came to Christ. It is reported one day that someone asked Wesley whether he expected to see Whitfield in heaven. And the evangelist replied, no, I do not. Then you do not think Whitfield is a converted man, he was asked. Of course he's a converted man, Wesley retorted. But I do not expect to see him in heaven because he will be so close to the throne of God and I so far away that I will not be able to see him. Isn't that wonderful? Though differing on major theological issues, John Wesley did not have an ounce of envy in his heart towards Whitfield. What does it matter, says Paul? I rejoice because Christ is lifted up. And we discover Christ is his first priority. Second priority is others. And the third priority is himself. We used to have a a song when I was very small about joy. Do you know, I've been trying to remember. I can't remember it, but the words, some of the words were this. Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. J-O-Y. Not goat, but J-O-Y. That was Paul's list of priorities. Jesus first, others next, himself last. Where is he in your priorities? And he says this in verses 18 and 19, and yes, I will continue to rejoice. I will keep on rejoicing. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my vindication, my salvation. Paul deliberately makes the choice of continuing to rejoice. It's a choice to rejoice. And he continues to make it no matter what. Deliberately, carefully, thankfully, he rejoices. Now, how on earth does he do that? He tells us here. He says, I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, I know he is convinced that what has happened, his imprisonment, his impending trial. Remember, he's in prison. He does not know what's going to happen to him. He doesn't know whether he's going to be executed or set free or just kept in prison the rest of his life. Either he will be acquitted on trial or set free. He could be found guilty, but Christ will vindicate him, he says, when he meets him face to face. He takes, as the queen did, the long view. He takes the long view. 
The Lord is victorious in the end. And with him, so is Paul. And with him, so are we. No matter what. Our salvation will be complete one day. And in our experiences just now, and I don't know where you are. Some of you may be in the depths of a pit because of circumstances in your life that I know nothing of. But Paul was able to resoundingly say this. I know that in all things, God works for the good. For those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That's, That's transcending faith. And how does Paul reach this conviction? Through the prayer support of his brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul, he is never, he's not a proud man. He's not, he's not averse to asking fellow Christians to pray for him and his team. Pray that we'll persevere. Pray that we'll stay true. Pray that we will have the opportunity to come back to see you. Pray that we will, we will be faithful to Christ. We need people's prayers. And he was convinced that their prayers would be answered because they've been answered in the past. And God is faithful. And secondly, not just through your prayers, but through God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And the word provision here means lavishly given. It's not just one of these highfalutin meals you go to and you get the big huge white plate with a wee dollop of stuff in the middle. It's, it's a, a brewer's fair. Eat as much as you like. It spills over. And God has lavishly given you His Spirit. Lavishly. Do you understand that? He's given you Himself. That's the Spirit. In you. In me. And that is putrid brilliant. Lavishly. My cup's full and running over. Gosh, I think I'm getting geriatric. I'm I'm remembering all these old songs. I can't remember a single new song. Which church am I in? Um, The Spirit is poured out and overflowing through the prayers and the Spirit of Christ. I am convinced that I will be vindicated. Can you and I develop that mindset? Yes, we can. Can we deliberately choose to rejoice in the Lord? Not say, Lord, I'm glad I'm really ill and I'm glad I'm really depressed and I'm glad the circumstances in my life are awful just now. No, no. Lord, where I am just now, I don't want to be. But thank you that you are with me. And you have said that this, whatever it is, why? I don't know, but you're going to make this good for me. And you will take me through, and one day I will see you face to face. And it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. There is another old hymn. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. And we need to rejoice in the Lord and say, Thank you, Lord. Right now, thank you. Not wait till the problem's over, but thank you now that you are the Lord. You have things under control. You are the sovereign. You have allowed this to happen for a purpose I cannot see, but I trust you. I love you. I rejoice in you. It's a supernatural God we have. And not one thing in this life happens to you without Him allowing it to happen for a bigger purpose than you and I can see. So rejoice in Him. And we deliberately need to do that. I need to do that. I sometimes wait and feeling really low or really worried about something. And then I have to draw myself up and say, Lord, You are in control. Thank You. And when things are harsh or uncertain or difficult, like through the pandemic, when there are immense financial pressures on people throughout the world because of what is happening, because of concerns through illness, grief, uncertainty, will we decide to choose joy? To choose joy. It's not impossible. 
It is more than possible through our fellow Christians' prayer. Are you praying for each other? And through the abundant supply of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome all things in Him, and ultimately Christ will come for us, and we shall be vindicated. Our salvation shall be completed when we stand in His presence. And he says this, Paul, I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And through that prayer support, Paul is saying this, through the Holy Spirit filling, he is convinced that he would not be embarrassed, he would not be ashamed by what is happening, not be shamed and cower in a corner in the prison and say nothing. Not be ashamed by what people were saying. Despite all that was against him, he would carry on with courage in proclaiming Jesus so that Christ would be lifted up, exalted. Exalted above all others. I eagerly expect means this, I'm craning my neck. That's what it means, to s waiting expectantly for this to happen. And his only concern, not the fact he's in prison, not the fact that he's got poor food and poor circumstances, but Christ is being honored. And staggering, he says, if I am executed, my only concern is that I will honor Christ in my body. If I live and I'm set free, my only concern is I want Christ to be honored in life or in death. And thus, what about us? Wearsby in his commentary quotes, quotes this. Let me read this to you. Do, does Christ need to be magnified? Does he need to be Lifted up, after all, how can a mere human being ever magnify the Son of God? Well, the stars are immeasurably bigger than a telescope, yet the telescope magnifies and brings them closer. The believer's body is to be a telescope that brings Jesus Christ close to people. To the average person in the world, Jesus is a misty fi figure in history who lived centuries ago. But as a person watches a believer go through a crisis, they can see Jesus magnified and brought so much closer. When you're going through the crisis, people are watching. They're watching your life, your body, as it were. And you can be a telescope bringing Christ closer and magnifying him. The microscope, on the other hand, makes tiny things visible and look big. To the person who doesn't believe Jesus, it's not very important, not very big. Other people and things are far more important to them. But as the Christian is observed through a crisis in his or her life, others ought to be able to see how big, how important Jesus really is. The believer's body is a lens your life is a lens that makes little Christ look very big and a distant Christ come near. That's our task, to bring people closer to Christ. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain the central verse here. And I can't add anything to this verse. It's Paul's whole reason for living. Christ, Christ. Christ. If I live, live, it's to delight Christ. If I die, it's to have him lifted up always. And if I die, then that is more wonderful, for I shall be with him whom I've tried to serve all these years. Do you know, I'm not sure. I am where Paul is as he writes this. When I think of dying, most of the time, I feel a sense of loss. Of sadness. I'm not ready yet. I still want to see my family and my grandchildren grow up. I want to hold on to what I have. That's my immediate reaction when I think of death. 
I want to hang on here. Yet, you know, on the other hand, I've experienced now seven plus decades of this life to feel the burden of the effects of sin on this world. In society, it's brokenness, it's desperation and unfairness. The way that our leaders seem to delight in bringing the legislation in that flies in the face of Christian values and indeed is attempting to wipe all sense of God and Christ out of our thinking, assessing it at best irrelevant and at the worst as abhorrent to our liberal progressive society. I see all around me broken, sad people, destroyed family relationships, brutal abuse, physical, emotional, children left feeling hopeless and insecure. You know, a recent survey on the ITV uh, said that 87.5% of young people feel they have no hope for the future. That's awful. Our government policies determined by pressure groups, those with the loudest of voices. Churches are emptying, and many of those which are still open, what is being preached is not the gospel, but it leaves Jesus out. Weak-minded preachers and leaders who are taking people away from Christ, not towards Him, they are not acting as telescopes or microscopes for Jesus. And this world is broken because of sin, and the mastermind is Satan. And he controls our societies. He blinds them to the truth of Jesus, the only one who can save and restore. And so as I look around the world, I have another emotion, another feeling. I long for God's new world that the Lord is preparing and has prepared for us where there is no pain, no sickness, no sin, no death, no dying, no grief, no parting, nothing but love and light and unmatched beauty, where love reigns supreme, for God is there and He is love. I long for that world, and I honestly want to be there, and one day I shall but meanwhile, the Lord has me here, and a bit like King Charles yesterday, well, not quite like King Charles, but he said, as long as the years that I have left in my life, words to that effect, I will serve you by the grace of God Almighty. How wonderful. Pray that that becomes real in his life as it was in his mum's. I don't know how long I've got left. I'm well over three quarters of the way through my life. And he's left me here. And he calls me to live for him every moment I have left. And perhaps I need to pray what John the Baptist said, Lord, he, the Lord Jesus, must increase and I must decrease, become less important. And I need to keep praying that. And pray, Lord, help me increasingly seek to honor Christ. Be willing or even delighted to sink into the background so that people may see Christ and Him only. And Paul goes on to say this, if I am going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. Now, Paul is not just saying this kind of unemotionally. He is not saying this as if it's a Nessie and he's thought about. He is in that circumstance, in prison, not knowing execution or release. And he's saying, I'm torn. What shall I choose? A desire to be, depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. His dilemma what shall I choose? He's saying, live. This is a live stream from Paul. And he desperately wants to be with Christ for that he knows is far, far better. Better than life on earth. And the word depart here embraces two thoughts. It's a ship by the harbor and it's unhitching. 
the lines that hold it to the harbor because it's about to embark on a long voyage. Or it is soldiers in a camp, breaking up camp, having stayed there for a while, wrapping things up, folding their tents up, getting ready to leave before they go on a long march to depart. And he is totally Christ-centered and other people-centered next. If Christ wants him to stay alive and serve others, then he is content with that. He will stay. He writes as if he's still struggling. What should he do? Yet realizing that the decision is not actually his. He can't choose. It's the Lord's to make it for him. So he yields his heart to him. It reminds me of Jesus himself in Gethsemane. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. His concern for God's people is an example we could do well to follow. He seems to have convinced himself that the Lord would have him stay around a bit longer. He says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body alive. Continued, he believed if he stayed alive, his work would be fruitful. So we question, for me, for you, if the Lord keeps you alive this week, how are you going to serve him? How are you going to serve God's people and others? Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, says Paul, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. I know, he says, I will remain. I will continue with all of you to help you progress in your faith. That's why. And to bring joy in that faith, to bring joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Through our combined efforts, he says, you will once again recognize how wonderful Jesus is, honoring him in your lives, keeping him at the forefront of your lives and showing him off to others. Christ will be exalted. And that is back to the one overarching premise of Paul's life. Christ is first, Christ is last, and Christ should fill all that is in between. He's absolutely supreme. God, we'll read in the next chapter, and you'll come on to this. God has highly exalted Christ and bestowed in him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in submission of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, is sovereign God, to the glory of God the Father. So, answer the question, as I have to, to Him, for me to live is what? Is it Christ? For me to die, is it what? Is it loss or is it gain? Is it Christ? And we're left with that question. What do we live for? Like Paul, Christ? Cameron Nori said this, I will make as many sacrifices as possible to bring myself the best possible chance to become number one in the world. That is my goal. Maybe we should change the words a wee bit. And maybe we should say, I will make as many sacrifices as possible to give Jesus his well-deserved place as number one in my life. And in the world, that is my goal. Let's pray for that. Let's seek to make Christ first in all things, all of the time. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service, God, but to the people also in the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong, but I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution 
unless alone, unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I cannot live the Christian life without the support of Christian people alongside me, praying for me, beseeching God on my behalf. You cannot live without their prayers. And other people, people sitting next to you, cannot live the Christian life without you praying for them. So take it seriously. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God, help me to make good my vow. And God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, describing his body like a tent or clothing. He said, I I want to take these clothes off, but I don't want to be naked. I want to change these clothes for an immortal body. Because at present, I'm in the body, but I want to be with Christ. I want to be absent from the body, but with Christ. So we make it our goal, he says, to please him. Make it your goal to please him. What a challenge. What a challenge. Let's pray. You know our hearts, Lord Jesus. You know everything about us. And a bit like Peter, we pray, Lord, you know. You know that I love you. And thank you for your response. Peter, feed my sheep. Lord, you know that we love you, even though we let you down and sometimes we drop you in priority, but we love you. May you help us to love you more. And may we choose to do that and to be fruitful for you so that Christ, you are lifted up.